I didn't think you were going to be 92 to November. Yes, that's right. Oh, okay. You already got 92 on it. <laughs> Cheated. I knew we're, we're just uh, almost to the day. His well, is the 15th, I'm the 18th. And I was 53, he's 23. 53, Paul. Huh? You're not 53. No. You're born in 53. I he was born in 23. I was born in 53. There we go. That would explain my senility. And, and then Tom is 72. He's going to be 72. Yep. So Tom, I'm 62. Tom's 72, and he's 92 when we're swimming. Tom. What's Tom's last name? You know. Yes, Van Husick. Van oh, Husick. Yeah. He's 72. Is he really? Huh. Tom Van know. Husick. Yeah. Okay. All right. Comes from Wisconsin. It is 20, yeah. 20 after? 22. 22 after, so we'll try to make half hour. Okay. So we can with Kenny. He can talk. All right. We ready? Mm -hmm. Today's September 24th, 2015, and we're interviewing Kenny Stevens at Grand Prairie. Kenny's 92 years old. Kenny was born 11-15. 1923. My name is Stan Spear and I'll be the interviewer. Rita Corson will be the court reporter. Kenny, where were you born? Smithfield, Illinois. Do you know where that is? Yep, on Route 95. Okay. And uh, who were your parents, Kenny? And what were their occupation? They were farmers. Uh, SD Stevens was my father, and Elsie Stevens was my mother. And brothers and sisters? I had one brother two years older than me, and I had a sister that was eight years younger than me. All right. Are they still alive? My brother isn't. My sister is. Okay. Was your brother in the military? Yes. He came in about nine months after I did. And what was you in? I was in the Navy. And was your brother in the Navy? Yes. All right. What was you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was still 17, so I had just graduated from high school that spring, and so I worked on the farm, you know, with the harvest and all that sort of thing during the their summer. And you entered the what was you in? The, the Navy, did you say? Yes. Okay. In the early days, in the branch of service, you served the Navy. Was that wartime? The last day of my boot leave was December the 7th, 1941. What was the highest rank you achieved in the military? Machinist mate, first class. And you served how many years? Well, it was lacked about two weeks of being four years. And you enlisted, or was you drafted? No, I was. I enlisted. If you enlisted, why did you choose the Navy? Well, I chose the Navy. Uh, my father was in the Navy, and I heard stories about the Navy then. And I had a close buddy that I run around with uh, in high school that was already in the Navy, and and uh, I wanted to see the world. I've never been hardly outside the, uh, not very far away from home up to that time. Do you recall your first days in the military when you got drafted and where did, where did you leave from? Where did I leave from? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I uh, we went up to Peoria and there I got on a train, went to Peoria, I went to Chicago uh, where I and got to Great Lakes. And that was your boot camp, Great Lakes? Yes, just north of Chicago. How'd you feel about it when you got in there? Bad. <laughs> I regretted it. <laughs> I regretted it for some time, you see. You stand in line and get shots and get your hair cut and take orders? They cut all your hair off, you know, they practically all of it off. And, uh, and there was, uh, yeah, there was very rigid discipline, and uh, you had no freedom. They told you what to do all the time. It, it's something you had to adjust to, mm -hmm. you see. So after they did all that, 
what was your station for your boot camp? Right there, did you say? Yes, right there at Great Lakes. Uh -huh. And then where did you go for your first training? Right there at Great Lakes. That's the training base. Uh -huh. And what did they train you to be? What they trained me to be? They didn't train you to be anything. You just went through a boot camp there and uh, you would decide that later when you, let's say if you got aboard a ship, you would strike for whatever kind of okay uh, that you wanted to do. Did they have what they call an A school to go to? They had, uh, they had schools to uh, go to, but since the war broke out, right at the last day of my boot leave, they shipped a lot of us right out there on some uh, ships. And I, in a few days, I wasn't uh, at Great Lakes over three or four days probably, till I was shipped out and sent to California to get aboard a destroyer at Mare Island, California. So after boot camp, you didn't get like a leave like a lot of guys got? Well, yes I did. I had about 10 day leave but the last day of my boot leave was December the 7th, 41, when the war broke out. If, I, if it had been uh, war broke out sooner, I would have had a shorter boot leave. Mm -hmm. Do you recall your instructors while you was in your boot camp? I, I remember what the guy looked like, but I can't remember his name. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, did they treat you pretty good, or were they pretty tough on you? Well, they were tough, but uh, I, I noticed some of the uh, drill instructors of others were a lot more strict than the one we had, and uh, I really, I actually liked our instructor. So, how did you adapt to the military life once you got uh, uh, away from Chicago? Oh, uh, once I got from, uh, well, it was, uh, let's say when I first got aboard ship, you're talking about. Okay. We weren't aboard ship, but uh, a few days till we were escorting a convoy to uh, Hawaii. And what happened there is we run into one of the worst storms you ever saw. And was this the, your destroyer you was on? Yes. The USS Clark? USS Clark. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, looks pretty good size, but I imagine out in the ocean it gets pretty small, right? Oh, yes. Compared to other warships, it's very small. Mm-hmm. And was it decommissioned, or what did ever happen to that ship? Uh, the ship was made into scrap iron after after the war because at the end of the war uh, we were uh, we were in in the Atlantic at this time in uh, Philadelphia and they had stripped the top of that off clear down to the hull and we was going to make a modern new destroyer out of it for the invasion of Japan. And we were supposed to have it ready for the invasion of Japan. And so it was stripped down to the hull when the war ended. So on that ship, was that tight quarters and, you know, your barracks and just a small area and they fed you right there? Was it pretty good sleeping and the food and your buddies, were they, everybody pretty good guys? Yes, I, uh, I, uh, I like the, the people aboard. You know? I had a lot of friends up over the ship, but the, what was difficult was when you first went aboard, you didn't know anybody, mm -hmm. and you were the lowest rate apprentice seaman, that's as low as you can get, and additionally, you were seasick, and I was seasick, and this real bad storm all the way to Hawaii, and so, uh, I deeply regretted at that time my decision to go to the Navy, but it got better later when, after I got friends and uh, knew some people and the water got a little smoother. I got over the sea sickness. So you liked the social life of the military then? I did once I got uh, to know some people.
people, yes. And then on the ship, what did they assign you to? What did they call your job assignment then? Well, my job was various things. Uh, first of all, I stood a watch, which was, uh, was on the gun mount on the front of the ship, which was 1.1s, was an aircraft gun, you see. But when you ring general quarters, and that means everybody goes to a battle station, and at the battle station, I was someplace else, and I was at different places. Uh, when you're uh, when you're a recruit, you're probably in a powder room hanging out powder to for the gun mounts or something. But later, uh, I was on the throttle after I was a machinist, first uh, second class. I I, be, I was on the throttle uh, in the engine room. Okay. Was you clear down underneath? Yes. So that was down and under and under the water, 20, 30 feet. Not that far, uh, but uh, maybe where I was, maybe 10 feet, something like that. So where did you actually serve then? You went to Hawaii, and then where did you go from there? We we uh, we were at Hawaii. Then we we saw the. Um, uh, what happened there at Pearl Harbor and about uh, two or three days from that we left with the first task force that went out to, uh, to hit the Japanese uh, with the Enterprise. A task force consisted of uh, an aircraft carrier and around the aircraft everything was designed to protect that aircraft carrier. That was the most important ship there. and. Uh, would be about uh, three or four cruisers. And then on the perimeter of the task force would be maybe a couple of squadron of uh, destroyers. And that, of course, is to protect particularly against uh, submarines. And also, if you were in battle, a destroyer one on each side of the carrier. Uh, to, if a torpedo was going to hit the carrier, you took it. <laughs> instead of the carrier. When you, got, when you got to Hawaii, what did you think when you saw that, what had been done there? What did I think of Hawaii? Yeah, well, what, what the Japanese had bombed there, what it looked oh, like. That, that, was a, that was a horrible sight. Uh, yeah, there was battleships uh, sunk there in the harbor, uh, some turned upside down, and uh, some people were entombed in, in those, uh, the hulls of those uh, ships there. That, uh, no, that was a. I, I got there 10th of January, uh, which was just slightly over a month after Pearl Harbor, and so I, I saw the devastation there. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a horrible sight. Was the weather good when you got there? Was it nice weather? The day we pulled into Pearl Harbor, it smoothed out, and and I soon got over my seasickness because I'd been sick for a long time. Do you remember how long it took you to get there to Hawaii? Yes, 15 days. You zigzag, you see, and you don't travel very fast, and then we're, besides this, we were in a bad storm almost all the time going to Hawaii. So once you got there, was you called a frontline ship, your destroyer? Were you kind of the front line going after them? Well, we were the, uh, at that time, yeah, we were a front line, let's say, destroyer. But after a, a year or so, new destroyers come out there. And I saw we were going to be replaced because they were better than we were. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly because this was a war against aircraft and they had better anti-aircraft guns on the newer ones than we did and I I thought we won't be out here too much longer and we weren't. Is that right? Did you witness a lot of shooting and fighting yourself? Uh, I didn't uh, although we were in the battle and so forth uh, I was down below I didn't see any of it you see, the only time 
I, I witnessed anything uh, was uh, when we left with the task force, uh, with the Enterprise, we were dispatched off of that to go down to Samoa because a Japanese submarine had uh, he'd come up out of the water and and bombarded the island, and and so we went down there uh, to um, see what we could do about that, and so we uh, set patterns. We didn't even go to general quarters for that because. The, uh, they drop depth charges, roll them off of the end after the ship, you see. And uh, they were set for 300 foot. They'd pick up the sound. So we picked up the sound of that submarine uh, soon and we started setting patterns of depth charges till we, uh, a lot of stuff come up as a result, and uh, we never could pick up a sound afterwards, and we presumed that we got the sub. So after you were on your front lines, and then you went off the front line, where did you guys go, being that you weren't really fighting the war anymore? Well, we went uh, from uh, Samoa to join another task force, which was the uh, uh, Oh, can't even think of the name of it. Uh, but we we joined another task force. It wasn't the Inter Enterprise. It was the Lexington. And uh, so when we first got there and joined that task force, we said, um, "What's the scuttlebutt? Are you acquainted with scuttlebutt? BS, information and stuff. Because they don't tell you anything. The information leaks down from the bridge, though." So and eventually you pick it up. And so they said, the scuttlebutt is that you've got about three days to live yet. Uh, they said, uh, you, our ship and one other destroyer and one cruiser uh, has volunteered to go on to, into the Rubul Harbor, which was 17 Japanese ships in there, and this was on a suicide mission, and you weren't expected to come out. So uh, you better take advantage of the two or three days, whichever you got left uh, to go. Well, this didn't happen because we were discovered by a Japanese plane, and pretty soon they sent uh, a wave of bombers out. Well, our, bar our aircraft was chasing these. Uh, and they were chasing them over the horizon when uh, there was another wave of bombers come out and there was only one plane up there and this guy uh, he shot down six of them in just a few minutes and he became the first ace in World War II and this was the first air and sea battle of World War II you see now he finally ran out of ammunition. He was trying to hit him with his wings. Now, do you know who this was? Uh, his name was Butch O'Hare. Oh, I was thinking Audie Murphy. <laughs> of course, that was a ground guy. <laughs> his name was Butch O'Hare, and Butch O'Hare uh, was the first ace, and you you can see his plane that he used, it's hanging up in the O'Hare field. That's, that's probably it right field. here, isn't it, Kenny? That's, that's, that's it. it. That's it? Yes, these were prop, prop planes at that time. What would you call that? They weren't P-52s or none of that stuff, were they? The, uh, they were a uh, Grumman fighter plane. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what I... Now, one of them that he shot down was a fire, and we had carrier guards, so we was going right alongside the Lexington. And so they, uh, uh, he, he was a fire, and he was going to try to crash into the Lexington to do some damage because he knew Israel. And so he come right over our bow, practically, you know, 
And so we had everything on that ship shooting at it, you know, and it blew it up just before it hit the Lexington. So that whole task force never really, they dropped bombs, but they missed everything. <laughs> and uh, the only, we had a few bullet holes in the snack, but that's the only damage, only damage we had. It didn't slow us down or anything, and that was fine. But what I learned later about Butch O'Hare, who was his father. Oh, the movie star? No, his father was the lawyer for Al Capone. Oh. You see, and when he, uh, but he, uh, he raised his boy right and uh, when, when he grew up, he asked his boy what he'd like to do, and he didn't hesitate. He said, I'd like to be in the Navy Air Force, and they went down to, uh, to enlist him, and they wouldn't take him because of the reputation of his father. Uh, so, being a lawyer, he'd make a deal with him. He says, if you let this boy in, I'll turn state's evidence against Al Capone. He did that, and they let him in. They made a deal. Is that right? Conse uh, subsequently, uh, his father was mowed down by the Al Capone gang on the streets of Chicago. Oh, I guess. So, uh, a lot of people do not know how O'Hare Field got its name, but it was from that battle. Oh, I didn't know that. Right there. O'Hare Fields. Did you meet a lot of friends? Did you make a lot of buddies when you was in the service? Yes, I had quite a few buddies. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, made it more bearable because at first I didn't know anybody. I was the lowest rate you could get and I was seasick. And I didn't feel good about it, but things got better. And uh, I eventually enjoyed the Navy. Do you ever keep in contact with anybody, or do you ever go back to any of the uh, get-togethers? We didn't till 1993, and uh, they started a reunion. And uh, even though I thought I knew about everybody on the ship, uh, we had it in San Diego, and I, I saw all those guys walk in, and I didn't know any of them except one guy. Uh, and the guys that I were closest to never never showed up there. But uh, some of them, I figured out who they were later. But a lot of them, it just seemed like strangers to me. But we had this uh, for quite a few years uh, after 1993 until about uh, five years ago. And uh, there were three years we had it in East Peoria there. And my daughter up in East Peoria, uh, she uh, she put out the invitations and uh, managed to, managed it, and uh, so we did get pretty close to those guys, you see, uh, and uh, and we still are in contact with those that are still still alive. But is there how many is there? Do you remember how many is alive now? Uh, out of those. There's only about three or four that we know now that are still alive uh, from them. Uh, the others, uh, there's some of them we just never heard from, we don't know, and we know a lot of them, uh, a lot of them died, you see. When you was out on the ship, or destroyer, how did you stay in touch with your family or friends back home? Well, when we first went out, we didn't uh, keep in touch because there was uh, we didn't we didn't get our Christmas mail till July. <laughs> you see, mm -hmm. uh, supply lines weren't good at the first part of the war. You see, and and we went on uh, uh, part of that first year. We we called it the starvation cruise because. We went for quite a while that we couldn't get food 
except, well, we had uh, beans and kind of wormy rice and we had sugar and coffee and about one biscuit a day and people wore chambray shirts and they cut the tails off and patched them and uh, they started growing beards and uh, and they uh, and they made knives in the machine shop and they looked like a bunch of pirates on there for quite a while but eventually after what we call the the uh, this this uh, period without supplies we eventually went back to Hawaii for a day or two and we loaded up at on supplies and after that we always had plenty of food after that uh, and it was reasonably good. Did you have any recreation time? Where did they take you like for a break? Well we didn't have much in the ways of breaks but there was a there was a few times once we uh, pulled in we was in there maybe 24 hours or so in uh, Sydney Australia and uh, that was a that was a good break, and but we weren't there very long, you see. And uh, then there were two or three times we stopped in at uh, New Zealand, uh, and that would just be you know maybe a couple of days or so each time. But we were in Auckland, I think twice, in Wellington once, and. Uh, so that was, uh, those were good liberties, you know, if, uh, but uh, that's about the only time we had. Uh, once, once we came clear back to the States and were in San Francisco uh, and it was only 24 hours and only some of them got uh, liberty. Mm -hmm. I did, I got the mid-watch. And what were you like in this picture? You said you was about a second class. I think probably second class. Uh huh. Uh, at that time, uh, I'd made first class uh, shortly before. Uh, oh, during the last year there. Were you in the service when they said the war was ending? Yes. Where were you? Do you remember where you were when you yes. heard that? Yes, I I remember very well. Uh, we had pulled in the Navy, Philadelphia Navy Yard. That's when they stripped our ship clear down to the hull and were rebuilding it for the invasion of Japan, you see. And so we were living in barracks. And uh, so the, the cooks for us were German prisoners of war. And uh, so we lived there. Uh, for maybe a couple of weeks, and we was there when the war ended. And when the war ended, uh, I, I knew the state was going to blow the whistle. And when the whistle blew, uh, the war was over. And uh, But before that, a uh, lieutenant came in and said, you and this new ensign, uh, are assigned to guard the ship. Now there wasn't any reason really to guard the ship. Nobody would have been on that ship because everybody went out celebrating. <laughs> I didn't get to celebrate. I had to stay on there on that ship that night and uh, they strapped 45s on us. Uh, and so there we were. Uh, stuck on that ship, uh, a bunch of hoses and machines all over the ship, and so I went back on the fantail to celebrate, and I pulled out my 45 and started shooting a few salvos out in the bay. And here come that lieutenant running down, <laughs> or the ensign running down the, the ship. What is going on here? I said, buddy, it's just you and me. Everybody is celebrating, but you and me. This is the only way we're going to celebrate. Bang. 
he said, you're right, and he pulled out his 45 and started shooting. <laughs> That's the celebration I did to end the war. So how'd you return home, from Philadelphia? Yes, on a train. To where? Chicago, and then from Chicago to uh, uh, Peoria, and then uh, my parents uh, picked me up there, and uh, I went back to back home. Yeah. Start farming again? No. No, this was in September. Uh, I got out September the 27th in 1945. And uh, so what happened then? Uh, I was talking to a, a neighbor of ours, and he said, now you're out of service, what are you going to do? And I said, I... Uh, I was thinking about enrolling at the University of Illinois, but I said I, I, I'll wait till the second semester because it's pretty late. He said, you might be able to get in now. And he said, I've got a, my son is it, enrolled in there. He just got out of high school. And he said, I'll go down with you. So we went down there and I did enroll. But when I started classes, I was two weeks late, and I was getting exams the first day in class sometimes. That wasn't good. Uh, but uh, I'd been away from uh, home long enough. I wasn't intimidated, and I uh, I got through fine. But it took a little while to get uh, get used to it. <laughs> So you went to, did you use what they call the GI Bill then? Did yes. they have that? Yes, that, that helped quite a bit. Uh -huh. So you went four years? Yeah, I lacked about two weeks of being in the Navy for four years, yeah. And then you went to U of I for four years after that then? Well, I, I went through the U of I in three years by going to summer school. So you adapted to civilian life pretty quick then? Yes, yes. Uh, Do you think the military helped you with that? Well, yes. Uh, you notice that uh, a lot of a lot of kids that start into college there, they have to adjust from being away from home, and this sort of thing. There's some of them are homesick and all sort of thing. That was no problem for me. I mean, I practically I thought I was home there <laughs> because I'd uh, I'd been about three years and hardly saw the states. Mm -hmm. You see. Did you join any veterans clubs when you was in the uh, when you got out or in college? You know, like the AMVET. Did they have the AMVET clubs or something in college then for that? Uh, no, I didn't join any any kind of a club. But, uh, afterwards, the American Legion. Okay. Yeah. And still probably belong. I, I belong to the American Legion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what have you done since college and since you separated from the service then? What did you do when you got out of college? Well, I taught uh, school for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the uh, 20th year, uh, I had started working on my master's. I finished my master's. And... Uh, I decided to change jobs and I started working with the uh, University of Illinois Extension Service, which was uh, farm business farm management. And uh, what we did is help uh, farmers with records, did their income tax, and uh, and things like uh, you know. Uh, if they'd buy a farm, we'd appraise the, uh, all the assets there and put them on depreciation schedule. And, uh, and, and we'd counsel them with about any management moves and this sort of thing. Um, and check their records very well. And, and all those records were used for comparative analysis. And so then we went over the comparative analysis with them uh, after tax season. Mm, let's see. But going back to the military, did you uh, have a good luck charm or anything you carried 
No, no, never did carry a good luck charm. But the food was pretty good when you got to eat the food, right? It was good, except for that, what we call the starvation cruise, <laughs> it was good, yes. Did they entertain you with any entertainment or anything? Did they bring anybody over? No, no, we didn't have any entertainment there. Uh, the only, uh, now later, uh, after we'd been out in the Pacific for the first year, uh, the new destroyers were coming out and they were replacing us. They were better uh, for this kind of a war than we were. And so we were dispatched to cruise uh, patrol from Panama Canal to Valparaiso, Chile. And uh, so for almost two years, we patrolled up that area. I didn't know at the time what we were patrolling there for, but I found later that they thought the Germans were smuggling ores out of those countries there, and we were patrolling for that. There was iron two. ore. Uh, I don't know what kind of ore. Okay. Uh, I I didn't even know of anything about it at the time. Oh. Okay. While we were there, but uh, that's what I heard afterwards. Did you get any leave like? Patrolling those shores, did you get to stop on any of those islands or <clears throat> for leave? We uh, we did stop at Valparaiso, Chile, and uh, Lima, Peru, and Guayaquil, Ecuador, and uh, once we stopped over at Galapagos Island. Uh, that's about 600 miles off the coast of South America, and that's where uh, Darwin wrote the Origin of Species. Hmm. Well, but you enjoyed your military time, though, it sounds like. Yes, after I got used to it, uh, I, uh, I had, well, I had a, a, a real good job. I was on the throttle. I enjoyed doing mm -hmm. what I was doing there, and uh, it uh, it was uh, in maneuvering. You were busy as bait, mm -hmm. but if you weren't maneuvering, you was just up there checking your turns there about every ten minutes and, and recording it. And then you're sitting back down there drinking coffee and telling stories and things like that. Why would you zigzag? You said you zigzag. What was the purpose of that? To avoid Japanese submarines that were laying for you. Uh, and we did that when we were convoying to uh, Europe. Uh, but the last year of the war, that's where we were. We went over to the Atlantic and we were escorting convoys to Europe uh, for the last year of the war. And at that time, we never had any problem with submarines. They had a lot of trouble the first couple of years, but the last year of the war, we didn't have, we never dropped one depth charge there in the Atlantic. Well, when you got discharged out of Philadelphia, did anybody else get discharged with you that went to Chicago? Oh, yes. There was a, there was a, quite a number of them, and I don't know exactly how many, but they discharged you on a point basis. Uh, and foreign service, you got so many points. And time, in wartime, you got so much. And I had more points, and I I'd had enough points for two men. Uh, so I was out, one of the first ones out. Okay. Uh, so when you're discharged the days and weeks after the military, did you join, uh, join the U of I right away, or did you take some time off, or how did you do that? No, that was, I was only about, home uh, much more in a week than I left go to the U of I and uh, I was uh, 
And of course, what I did was enroll late, you see. So I didn't uh, spend much time at home before I started school. Did the military experience when you was young affect your life and make you a better person, you think? Uh, it af affected you probably in maturation. You matured faster probably mm -hmm. uh, in there because when you were in high school you played football, basketball, and softball and all that sort of thing. If you made a mistake, you lost a score, you lost yardage or something like that. In the military, it's more serious. You might lose lives. And uh, so I would, I would say uh, your maturation is increased uh, rapidly when you're in the service. So what's your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, uh, let's say feelings about war, I, uh, I, I often quote and think about Lord Acton. You ever hear of Lord Acton? He was uh, from uh, Great Britain and he said, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And uh, I thought how often we've seen that if you, in your history. Uh, here was a man, let's say Hitler, who had absolute power, you see. And, uh, and there was the Japanese uh, junta military group, you see, they called the shots, and they had absolute power. And what were they able to do in World War II? They killed, uh, there are various estimates, but I saw one estimate there, the entire amount was probably 72 million people killed. And besides the devastation, you see, of cities, the ship sunk, uh, the, uh, uh, how it affected families, you see, and uh, a lot of fatherless children and so forth. Uh, so what, what did anybody gain by the war? No. You see, nobody really wins a war. So in the end, you want to leave a message to your future generation as you're talking here in this interview. Who would you tell the future generation? Well, one thing, if we had the, if we had the power to avoid having any one person, uh, that would have the power, uh, like any one of those, Mussolini, mm -hmm. Hitler, any of those. Uh, if the people ruled, I don't think they would start an aggressive war, you see. Mm -hmm. And what I think about in the future, uh, if somebody, suppose like one of the, the, the terrorists would come up with um, an atomic bomb, and drop an atomic bomb. Uh, there's a number of countries that have them now, and there will be more. And uh, in a few hours, uh, they could uh, wipe out civilization, frankly, like that. That's right. That's right. And uh, so, uh, what could we do? to avoid wars in the future there. How could we settle disputes between us without war? Yeah. And, and that will be the major uh, consideration. I think one thing maybe that helps this is because all countries are tied up economically now. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, anything that happens in one country economically sends tremors all over the world. And uh, you notice that in the stock market. <laughs> sure do. Mm -hmm. Well, Kenny, is there anything else you'd like to discuss? Um, did we miss anything or anything else you'd like to say? No, I think we've hit most of it. <laughs> uh, most of it. 
The thing I did forget to ask you, uh, you got married and you have how many children? Uh, I had four children, uh, four girls. Uh, I lost one girl. And uh, so uh, I've got uh, one daughter at Weematuck, one in East Peoria, and one on a farm there at Blandonsville. Okay. I think that concludes and I want to thank you very much for your time in the service and for the interview today. Okay. Well, thank you.